I'm Yafa Mason, a school librarian in Los Angeles, California. I'm here today with Todd Hazak Lowy, the author of the new book, We Are Power, How Nonviolence Activism Changes the World. There's Hi, everybody. I'm Todd, and here's the book. <laughs> Todd, Thanks for having me, Yafa. Thanks for coming on, Todd. I really appreciate your time. Um, Todd is a professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. He's the author of seven books, and he's translated a half dozen more. So Todd, tell us, why did you decide to write this book? I decided to write this book because I was looking for a project that would be somewhat like a project that I did just before. So I have more show and tell. I co-wrote this book, which came out in 2018, which is called Roses and Radicals. It's a history of the women's suffrage movement. And it was the first time um, that I did a book that was at all like that, by which I mean, you mentioned that I've published a number of books, but I've published a lot of different kinds of books. I've published books for adults and books for young readers and fiction and nonfiction. And Roses and Radicals was the first book I wrote that was really a history for young readers. And- I enjoyed that one. Oh, well, thank you. I love that book as well. Um, and th there was a very particular exercise that's required to write a book like that, which is you do a lot of research and um, you read a lot of books that are out for adults on the topic. And then you figure out how do I tell this story for, let's say, a 12 year old reader in a way that is accessible, but is also captures the complexity and the nuance and the truth of what is always a very complicated story. And I really, really liked doing that and I wanted to do it again. The other half of it, and I think this explains more how I came to this particular project, is that when I was working on Roses and Radicals, I was spending a lot of time studying really three women, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, and Alice Paul. And I was just amazed with all of them. They were not perfect people by any stretch, but they were just, I mean, I was a man in my late 40s that didn't think he had heroes or needed heroes. And I was just amazed by these women. I just, they're by their bravery and their determination and their dedication. And I wanted to have a similar experience. I wanted to continue writing about people and causes that I admired. I really felt like in all honesty, in 2017, I needed that experience. And so I looked around for another project and it took quite a while. And this project was actually suggested to me of all places in a cafe in Tel Aviv in Israel by a woman named Maya Severe, who's a friend of mine, who's a writer there. And she said, well, how about writing a book about nonviolence? And I was like, huh. And um, I think like everybody else, I sort of knew what nonviolence was. Like the word basically, it, it seems like it tells you what it's about. Um, and I knew Martin Luther King a little bit, and I knew Gandhi a little bit, and that was probably it, maybe a little bit more. Um, and so I started looking into it and doing a lot of research and write and reading of just, just to try and wrap my head around the subject. And the more I read about it, the more I was like, this is amazing. Um, so tell us, let me interrupt yeah. for a sec. Go ahead. What exactly is nonviolent activism? Okay, yes. So... As I define it in the book, and this is not a definition that I've really made up, though I don't think everybody defines it exactly the same way. First of all, nonviolent activism is sort of a subcategory of activism. So there's activism that it is not violent, but I, didn't, I don't call it nonviolent activism. And, and my definition of nonviolent activism, the crucial thing is that there's something disruptive about it. So for instance, if you want to make kite flying illegal in your neighborhood, you can make a petition and go to all the parks and get people to sign no more kite flying. That's activism, but it's not nonviolent because petitions are part of institution that we have of you can get petitions, you can bring it to the city council, and you're playing by rules that are in place that allow for change to happen. Nonviolent activism, as I talk about it in this book, is activism that is intentionally disruptive. So instead of, I don't know why I wound up with the example of kite flying, but <laughs> instead of a petition, you'd have a protest or a demonstration or you'd boycott kites. And you would do something that would make the, the practice of kite flying 
interrupted in some way, disrupted, you'd interfere with it. And there's a whole spectrum of things that people can do that are more or less disruptive, right? So having a protest marching down the street is not that disruptive. If you have a million people, it gets disruptive. Boycotts are more disruptive. And then near the other edge is this thing called civil disobedience, which is a fancy word for breaking a law through your protest, right? So let's say this is another weird example. We all decide that the speed limit is much too low. And so we get a bunch of people to drive 100 miles an hour down the highway together, knowing that they can't arrest us all, right? That's a dumb thing to do. But that's, that's what civil Don't do that. Don't try that at home. <laughs> yeah, don't try that at home. So, um, so that's, what, that's what nonviolent activism is, is disruptive activism. So why does it work? Why does it work? Oh, nonviolence works for a variety of reasons. One of the reasons it works is that in general, nonviolence is a, is a method or a strategy used by people that is, appear to not have power. So if you think about the examples in the book, you have Indians in, in the, what is now the country of India who were colonized. You have women who can't vote. You have African-Americans living under segregation who are also denied the vote. You have farm workers who have almost no rights at all. And so in general, it's a strategy used by these groups of people to find access to power. Now, how do they do it? They do it in a couple ways. One is all these people that are seemingly powerless usually actually exist in larger numbers than their oppressors, right? This is clearest in, let's say the case in India where there were 300 million Indians and 100,000 British that were kind of running the colony. Um, similarly, in the case of the field, in the farm workers, there were the owners who were obviously outnumbered by the farm workers. And so the, the first ingredient to their potential power is there's more of us than there are of them, right? And so if we can unite, then we can be a force. Related to that is that there's this thing we call the status quo, which is a fancy term for the way things are, right? When you're in a situation in which there's sort of an oppressor or an oppressed or a privileged and an underprivileged or a powerful and a powerless, the powerful like the status quo, it works for them, right? Whereas the powerless don't like it. So if we go back to that idea I was talking about before of disruption, one of the reasons that nonviolence works is because it disrupts the status quo. So all these people that seem to not have power who don't like the status quo get together, they have a boycott, they have a strike, they have a protest, they break laws, and suddenly the status quo is not the status quo. It's been interrupted, it's been upended. Someone who's dependent on money through the status quo isn't making money, right? Someone who is is used to sort of business as usual or things being peaceful is suddenly confronted with a different situation. The other piece of it, or another piece of it, is that I've been talking about two groups, but there's always a third group of some sense. So let's say this is clearest maybe in the case of the farm workers. You have the farm workers, you have the owners, but we all know that if there's 300 million people in America, maybe 300,000 are in either of those groups. And everybody else, people like me and you, that go to the supermarket and buy food. For that powerless group to, to eventually win, they have to get us on their side, right? Us actively or even us just in the sense of kind of public opinion, right? And so one way they do that is if I break the law and go to jail, and I do it out of principle because the law is an unjust. And I don't harm my opponent in the process. I don't throw rocks at him. I don't beat him. Then you become sympathetic toward me. You see that I have belief in what I do. I'm willing to sacrifice for it. I'm willing to suffer for it. And that conflict is also an opportunity for me to sort of speak my truth. For me to say, you might not ever think about what's involved in the strawberries that you buy at the supermarket. Well, let me tell you, there's a lot of suffering involved in them. And I'm going to go to jail, or I'm going to forego my pay. I'm going to go on strike 
so that you can know, and then you can decide what are you going to do about it. So in the case of the farm workers, in the part of the story that I talk about, they eventually get 17 million people in North America to stop buying grapes. And they essentially shut down the grape industry. And that was by convincing people like you and me to side with them against the owners. So that's a large part of how and why nonviolence works. And I, I didn't realize that when I had, when I was reading the part about the great boycott, I'd already always heard the term great boycott and I didn't realize how impressive it was that they were able to spread their message so widely throughout the whole country. Um, yeah. Going back to the concept of nonviolence, one mm -hmm. of the things that struck me um, was that it's really only nonviolent on one side. Right, right. So, yeah, so right, you hear nonviolence and you're like, oh, no one's getting hurt. Um, and that is, is not often accurate. So uh, the, what's involved is that the activist is choosing, I will not harm my opponent physically. I won't take up arms. I won't injure them physically. But what nonviolence is, and this is also one of the things that is kind of most counterintuitive and a, and a key thing to understand, is that nonviolent activists are seeking out conflict. So for instance, there's a quote that starts my Gandhi chapter where he says, I regard myself as a soldier, a soldier of peace. And there's kind of seems to be a paradox or an internal contradiction. What does it mean to be a soldier of peace? But it means that I am seeking conflict, but it's conflict in which I'm not harming the other person. But what that will lead to in certain situations, when you keep sort of in a sense, provoking this other stronger person or app set of people or institution is they will hurt you. So a, a very clear example of that is in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963, there were these protesters and they were marching peacefully. They were literally, their intent was to walk through the city, to go to white neighborhoods, to try and integrate the city. And eventually they were met with fire hoses and dogs and things like that, right? And so that is related to this notion of what the nonviolent activist is willing to do is I will suffer instead of my opponent suffering. That will be the nature of the conflict. And again, it makes the other person look bad and it makes me look strong, right? Because we were talking about that the nonviolent activist tends to come from a powerless group. And I show my strength through my ability to withstand suffering, my, will, my readiness to sacrifice. And you can even think about it in a slightly smaller but more current way that Greta Thunberg's decision to skip school, right, to go on strike from school is, I'm going to give up my education for this, hmm. right? I want, I'm, I want to learn, right? And, I, and I'm not going to learn, right? Um, and in that way, I'm going to disrupt things. So far, that movement has not involved sort of physical threats and violence, but who knows what will happen. Yet, right? Yet. Right. We're um, early. So where did nonviolence come from? I know a lot of us learned about Martin Luther King Jr. As, in nonviolence and that he learned it from uh, Gandhi. Did Gandhi come up with it? Or, or where does the whole concept come from? So nonviolence in, in various forms is quite old. The best known in the West example would be Jesus, right? In the Sermon on the Mount and Turn the Other Cheek. Um, there's one of the early books I read, I have lots of show and tell, is this <laughs> book. This is a book for adults. It's called Nonviolence, The History of a Dangerous Idea by Mark Kurlansky, who's written all sorts of books on like cod and salt and things like that. Um, and this is a book that really covers, it, it starts in very, very long ago and it, it takes up all these cases. Um, what Gandhi did Gandhi, I think, rightly gets credit for sort of modernizing it. And by having campaigns that were as vast as his in a, in a place that mattered so much, drew a lot of attention to something that had existed before, but he also refined it and developed it, right? He talked about his campaigns as experiments in a way. But he, so he took a little bit from local indigenous religious traditions, in particular the Jain religion in India, um, but he was also influenced by 
the Russian writer Leo Tolstoy, who's most famous for War and Peace and Anna Karenina, but who also wrote on the importance of pacifism and nonviolence. And they overlapped a little bit and actually had a correspondence. Oh, wow. um, there's also the famous 19th century American writer, um, Henry Thoreau, who's best known for Walden, but wrote a very famous essay called Civil Disobedience. And so really what Gandhi did was he sort of fused a bunch of things together, some of which could be said to come out of his tradition and some of which were from other traditions. And he put them together and he kind of mixed them up and then he built on them. Um, so Gandhi and nonviolence is in its way a bigger, newer thing, but it, it, he didn't invent it out of nothing. Going back to what you were talking about, the women's suffrage movement, I don't, you know, that never seems to come up in the conversation about nonviolence. In fact, I hadn't heard of Alice Paul before I read your Roses and Radicals book. Um, you know, everybody knows about Elizabeth Cady Stanton and um, Susan B. Anthony, but Alice Paul seems to have been pushed aside. Um, why, do, why do you think that is? So first of all, if you look over my shoulder, can you see the <laughs> Alice Paul poster? <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I'm a big Alice Paul fan. Um, so there's a number of answers to this question. The first I would say is that, and I think this is a general point that I think a lot of adults don't understand, and I think probably a lot of younger people don't understand, but I think are ready to understand is that it's always important to know that there's a difference between the past and history as this thing that's written. And, and I think we often tend to think like, the historians have got it right. They've told the story accurately. And that's not always the case. There's people that are forgotten about. There's people that um, are overlooked. And then sometimes they're discovered. And I think in the moment we're living in actually right now, Alice Paul is sort of in the process of being discovered. Um, I actually know there's somebody apparently who's writing a musical about her that I think will be on Broadway when it comes out. Um, there was a book that came out about a year or two ago about radicals of the 20th century. And she was one of, I think, six people that was talked about in the book. So there, there is a renewed interest in her, but why is she overlooked? Well, first, I think it's important to say that the women's suffrage movement in general is overlooked, right? I mean, nobody thinks twice about the fact, and, and this is utterly deserving, that there's streets and schools all over this country named after Martin Luther King Jr., right? And again, he deserves it. Um, but I don't know of any schools called Susan B. Anthony Academy or Elizabeth Cady Stanton's whatever. I don't know of any streets named after these women. Um, Sojourner Truth has some things named after her I've seen. So in general, the movement's very, very overlooked. Now, the other part of that is for whatever reason in an overlooked tradition, if it's not getting a lot of attention, what's gonna happen is that one or two people are gonna be like, that's the movement. And for whatever reason, it's Susan B. Anthony. It's not even Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who arguably is just as important who actually really started the movement um, and was active almost as long as Susan B. Anthony was. Um, for whatever reason, I don't know if it's because when we were kids, they put out the Susan B. Anthony coin and that was enough to sort of spread her name. But um, Alice Paul is just not really mentioned. Now there's another reason for this as well, which is that Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, in a way Cesar Chavez, they were all people that in addition to being activists were writers and were, I, were sort of public thinkers or ideologues or people that were talking about what they were doing. This is obviously clearest in America with the case of Martin Luther King who was publishing books while this was going on was obviously a, the great, greatest orator of the 20th century probably. And so he was kind of, making a record of himself while he was doing this. Gandhi also, his collected works, they run like tens of thousands of pages. Alice, B. Paul, Alice Paul was an activist. Hmm. And that was all she was. And she was a very devoted activist. And she did not write. And she didn't even like giving interviews. And very late in her life, somebody wanted to sit down with her and do a really long interview. And she was like, why would you want to do that? And I think she, in a way, she was a really bad self-promoter of herself. And when the, when the 19th Amendment got ratified in 1920, 
and this is another thing people don't know about her, she almost instantly went, she's the person who drafted the Equal Rights Amendment oh, wow. and, spent, and spent the rest of her life, I think she died in 77 or 73, she spent the next like four or five decades working every bit as hard on that as she did on suffrage. And so when she, she didn't have children, um, she didn't have a partner. And so when she died, there wasn't really a record of what she had done. And so it's really been up to other people to tell her story. Now, the last thing I also want to mention is that if we look at the history of nonviolence and the story it's been told, she was working at the same time as Gandhi was. And in fact, Gandhi was influenced in part by the British suffragettes who were using very disruptive tactics. And he went to England around 1910 to when he was in South Africa to talk to the, the British. And he was super impressed by what he saw. But that story is kind of over. It's 1920 and Gandhi sort of in a way still getting started and that story is just happening. And so when the American civil rights movement starts, they look to Gandhi as a model. And I've never seen anywhere in anything I've read that they were at all aware that there was this local history to follow. So, so part of the process, and this was something that motivated me to write this book is I wanted to give Alice Paul her due in this context, in the story of nonviolence. Thank you for that. She definitely deserves it. She's awesome. Uh, <laughs> so speaking about Martin Luther King Jr., um, you know, he was a leader for around 13 years or so, but you chose to focus just on that two-month period in Birmingham in 1963. Why, why did you pick that part specifically? So I knew very early when I began writing the book that there would obviously be a chapter about the civil rights movement. And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what I would write about. At the beginning, I actually thought I might write about the um, integration of the Nashville lunch counters. And I think it was 1960. I'm not positive. If you've read, I have it here somewhere, but I think it's in the other room. I forgot as my show and tell. But a great, great book on nonviolence is John Lewis's um, graphic comic. It's three volumes called March. Yeah. And, they write, he writes about that episode in there because he was involved in that. Um, for some reason, it, it, I, I, just, I was doing a lot of reading about the civil rights movement, trying to figure out what's the moment that I want to write about. So one thing I knew, first of all, was that because there's been so much written on the civil rights movement, I knew I wanted to pick a really narrow slice of time so that I could tell the story in a lot of detail. Because nobody needed another survey. Because even for younger readers, there's, I assume, dozens of those. So I wanted to find a slice of it that I thought was the most interesting from a point of nonviolent activism. And I wound up, I was reading this book. So if you want to get a sense of kind of how much is written about. Oh, wow. This, so this is the first volume. That's how wow. thick it is. And you can see how many words are on each page. This is one of the better known sort of for a, for a large audience. Um, a series of books on, it's, it's called America in the King Years. So it's about those 13 years. And when I read that and got to the Birmingham section, there were a few features of it that I thought were most interesting. One was that you had multiple tactics being used. One was that it was planned in advance, but then involved sort of changing the plan. One was that it was arguably, so here's another book I have on the same thing. Um, this is just about, this Birmingham thing and the subtitle of the book is the climactic battle of the civil rights revolution so there's a lot of people who believe that that episode though there was plenty of work to be done afterwards was kind of a real turning point in the history of the fight against segregation in particular in this country but then the last thing was that and I guess I don't want to give too much away though it's all history is that children were absolutely central and critical to the success of that campaign so in the middle of Birmingham campaign, there was this thing called the Children's Crusade where thousands and thousands of kids as young as six years old marched to go to prison. And that was what made the campaign successful because it broke, it overwhelmed the, the local prison system. It overwhelmed the police force there. And so for all those reasons, I thought it was kind of the most kind of jam-packed, interesting um, uh, 
chapter, uh, I could ask, add one last thing also, which is that you can draw a somewhat straight line from that to the Civil Rights Act. And, and from that to Kennedy sort of finally, President Kennedy finally getting behind this because he had waffled quite a bit up to that point. Thank you, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so another thing I noticed is that this, as you've said several times, is a book of history, but the subtitle of the book is How Nonviolence Activism Changes the World, Not Change the World. Um, and I'm curious about that choice. So, yeah. So first of all, interestingly, for a while, the title, subtitle of the book was in the past tense was changed. And it was suggested by one of the main people at the publisher to change it. And I, and I love that decision. So one of the things about this book, if you're going to write a book about nonviolence, there's actually sort of three ways you could do it. One is a how-to book. This is how to be a nonviolent activist. That's not something I'm really qualified to write. This book doesn't really have any of that. The second is to write a, a narrative, to write a story, to tell, and this is mainly what the book is. But the third choice is to write something that, if you would ever go to a publisher for children's book and say you want to do this, they'd think you're crazy, is I want to write a book of political theory, right? In other words, I want to write a book not about what happened, but about how do politics work, period. What is power, right? How do you get power? And this book, first and foremost, is the stories, right? But one of the things that the book does over and over again is that it's always sort of drawing lessons and saying, this is how, this is what power really is. This is how it works. This is how someone who seems to not have power gets power. And so to answer your question, even though I might be talking about the women's suffrage movement, that story is teaching us about power that is still true today. And so the book is about this is what nonviolence still does. The other thing is that as you get to the very end of the book, the conclusion of the book, which is very much an ongoing story, is about the climate movement. And what that story is showing is that this is stuff that's still happening and that people are using these strategies and tactics to make change now. It's, this is not a story that's just in the past. This is very much a story about right now. And, and these techniques change the world in the present tense. So it was very important to me, and I'm so grateful that we changed the title to the present tense to emphasize that. So speaking of the conclusion of your book, where you um, talked about Greta Thunberg and her climate change movement, um, do you truly honestly think that a young person or a group of young people today can really make a difference? I absolutely think they can, and I absolutely think they are. Um, what remains to be seen is sort of how much of a difference and how much they're able to grow the movement, but um, absolutely they can. I mean, there's no question that really within a year, Greta Thunberg, who it's important to point out, she didn't start climate activism by any sense, but she grew it in a way we could maybe say exponentially. Um, went from one person protesting to, um, in September of 2019, over two weekends, or it was over 7 million people, I think, around the world protested. And, and that's sort of remarkable. And, and I think, you know, I mentioned the Birmingham example. Um, it's important to note that in many of these other groups I talk about, young people are almost always involved. So we haven't talked at all about the chapter about um, the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia in the late 80s, but that was a that was a movement that in some ways was started by college students. Um, even Alice Paul, when she was leading the movement, was in her late 20s and early 30s. Uh, if you want to have your mind blown, I think when the Montgomery bus boycott started, I think Martin Luther King Jr. was maybe 26, 25 or 26. So I think in many cases, nonviolence has always been the territory of the young, in part because they don't take the status quo for granted. Adults are like, well, that's just how the world are. And kids are like, well, that's stupid, right? <laughs> and then the other thing is that in their way, kids are, and we all know, like, you have a teenager in your house, kids take risks much more readily than adults do. Um, and in that regard, young people are, are, are perfect 
they're perfect for, for nonviolence. The last thing about the climate movement is they, young people can speak about it with an authority that adults don't because it's most clearly, this is about my future, right? So if, if you're 60 years old, you're gonna be alive maybe another 30 years, maybe things will start getting bad, but not that bad, but, but my life is gonna be affected by this. And so they can speak with a, with a moral authority that's very powerful. And I think it's been a very central part of why Greta Thunberg's speeches, in addition to her activism, have been so powerful. Because she represents this generation that's going to be most affected by this. So I absolutely think that, that young people can make a difference here. I absolutely think that your book is going to inspire a lot of young activists. Um, as they see the difference that they can make and should make. As you said at the beginning, um, now is a time more than ever that we need heroes. And you've highlighted some amazing ones. Um, is there anything else that you wanna add about why this book is so important right now? So, well, first of all, thank you. And I, I hope you're right. I mean, I hope this book reaches a lot of people and I, and I hope it inspires people young and old to, to do something. The, the last thing I'll say, I'm going to get a teeny bit political here, is that, and this goes back a little bit to something we were talking about at the, near the beginning of this conversation, is that there's this notion of sort of institutions and extra institutional activism and all this stuff. So we live in a country in which there's all sorts of built in methods and systems that allow for some amount of change, which allow people to have a voice and all that. And that's really good. I'd rather live in a democracy than not live in a democracy. Um, but it also seems that we're in this moment right now in which a lot of our institutions are failing some of us very badly and other institutions are failing all of us right now. So we are, for those of you, we're, we're talking on today's April 3rd and we're in the middle beginning of this very scary thing of this coronavirus. And one of the things that seems to be true is that a lot of our institutions are not functioning the way they should. And a lot of our government is not functioning the way they should. Um, and it's very clear if we look at, at the climate crisis that our institutions also are not responding as they should. And so I think one of the reasons that this book feels to me very sort of timely and urgent is that I think we are in a moment where we need very radical change to address the problems that are confronting us. And I don't think we're gonna only be able to, for instance, vote our way out of this. Um, there's all sorts of reasons that even if we voted in, if we're talking about climate, the person who is most vocal about the need to take drastic measures one of, the one of the reasons that people said don't vote for him, in this case, Bernie Sanders, is because he won't be able to get anything done because the Senate, right, for instance, won't let him. So we're in this moment where it seems clear that we need activists to nudge the institutions, to push them really hard to make change. And one of the reasons that one of the measures of the way nonviolent activism works is that it's kind of in this conversation, in this dialogue, with the institutions, right? So you have the civil rights movement and that leads to the Civil Rights Act, right? So you do this stuff, you actually break the law to change the law. The suffragists broke the law to get an amendment to the constitution, right? And so um, that's what we need right now. And it's scary for people because it's, it's radical and it's disruptive and it's unclear how it's gonna play out. But I really believe we're in a moment that we, that has to be what happens. Because otherwise, I just don't think our institutions on their own are gonna do this. They need to be forced to do this. And I think if it's done nonviolently, I think we have the best chance of a, of a good outcome, of an outcome that doesn't lead to a lot of violence, of an outcome in which everybody is ultimately on the same side. That's a, a central part of a lot of these movements. Martin Luther King Jr. always talked about, this was about the country. This wasn't about blacks. This was about being living in a just society. And so I really believe right now that this is a type of change that is really, really vital right now, so. All right, well, thank you so much. Again, I've been talking to 
Todd Hazak Lowy, and his new book is We Are Power How Nonviolence Activism Changes the World. Thank you. So Thank much. you for your time and for your questions. Um, uh, and I have a website. There's going to be other things up there. I have recorded myself reading aloud the first few chapters. I know a lot of people are stuck at home right now and are looking for things to listen to and watch. So um, if you can't get your hands on the book yet, that's a way to start getting a sense for it. But thank you for your questions and for your interest. I really appreciate it. Good talking to you. Bye-bye.